today we've got a presentation of all blue exploitation, followed by a beginner's night on how to be a blue teamer. So let's get going. So a couple of definitions want to get straight first are vulnerabil vulnerability and exploit. These can are used interchangeably, but they really shouldn't be. A vulnerability is more so a weakness. This, these definitions are just ripped from Wikipedia, but a vulnerability is defined as a weakness which can be exploited by a threat actor, such as an attacker, to perform unauthorized actions in a computer system. Basically, a vulnerability is the actual just bug in the code. And then an exploit is a piece of software or sequence of commands that take advantage of a bug or vulnerability to cause unintended behavior to occur in software hardware. So vulnerability is a weakness in the code, and the exploit is actually just taking advantage of it to make evil things happen, whatever they may be. Um, so the reason vulnerabilities exist is mainly just because there is a lot of source code for the things we run. A couple examples are that PHP is the base um, PHP-source, which is just the base PHP interpreter, it is 370,000 lines of source code. It's not including a lot of popular um, add-ons like PHP Apache or PHP MySQL, which can probably bump up most PHP um, instances to at least half a million. Um, some bigger examples are the Linux kernel, which 2015 is not true, but that's like last year. That's 23 million lines of source code. That's just the kernel. It doesn't include like GNU core utils. And also, there's 50 million lines of code in Windows 10. So basically, a ton of code. You've all written code before. You know how easy, how easy it is to write code with bugs in it. So imagine writing code that is 50 million lines long. You're sure to have bugs. And you're sure to have some of those bugs end up being security holes. So basically, for as long as we're writing code, which will be forever, we're going to be trying to play like again a game of catch up and patch the code, which is kind of this never ending cat and mouse game or red queen dance, I guess, where there's code is vulnerable, vulnerable, we patch it, and then new, com co new code comes out, we've got to patch that as well, and it just kind of never ends. So vulnerabilities will basically be an issue forever until we just run out of code. So some common examples of vulnerability exploitation, or some famous examples, I should say. Um, I remember the WannaCry ransomware attack that was in, I think, m February or March 2017, where um, a bunch of hospitals in the UK just started getting ransomware all at the same time. Uh, this spread really quickly to about 200,000 victims in four days. No one really knew what was going on, so they just kind of turned the internet off in hopes that that would work. This eventually stopped when a malware researcher, Malware Tech, was looking at the source or was trying to reverse engineer WannaCry, and he found that it was calling out to a remote server, and if it was able to connect, it would shut off. So he bought that domain, and then that just caused the initial spread to, to halt. Um, the reason WannaCry worked was because there was a vulnerability slash NSA backdoor in Windows called Eternal Blue. I don't know if it's actually confirmed the NSA did it or not, but it's widely believed so. so um, the patch for this was released by Microsoft, by Microsoft about a month before the attack, but they're hospitals, so they don't really have a strong vulnerability management or patching plan, so they were still vulnerable, and it was able to spread that quickly. Um, another famous example from the same year was the Equifax hack, which caused 145 million Americans to have their personal info get leaked and have people file their taxes for them. Um, there's a ton of things Equifax did wrong in this situation, but the main thing that they did wrong was that they were running a server with Apache Struts, which is a, um, it's basically a server framework for Java, so if you want to write a server, a web server that's written in Java, that's what Apache Struts is for. Similar to um, what's called Spring Boots, if you've taken 309. Uh, basically, the same situation as before, where there was a critical security patch released by the, the Apache Struts people, and Equifax just didn't patch it for two months, so it got exploited. Hackers were able to um, get onto the network, and then about six more security holes later, get everyone's data. And then lastly was the Config Worm back in 2008. This um, took advantage of another Windows vulnerability called MS08067, which was bef this was in the knots, so this was before we gave vulnerabilities cute names, so it just has that for its name. Um, this one didn't have any specific target, just kind of attacked computers wherever it could find them, mostly Windows XP, and this caused about $9 billion in damage across millions of hosts and I think 190 countries. Von um, MS08067 was patched in September 2008, but Configure came out in November 08, so again, another two-month gap between patch and initial exploitation, 
and it still didn't have any issue with enough unpatched systems. Two months later, that was able to spread as quickly as it did. I think this is the most, um, no, never mind. Um, but kind of the common trend is two or three of these are Windows, and nobody wants to update Windows because Windows update is the worst thing in the world. So even though something, even though people don't want to update, you kind of need to, otherwise you'll get ransomware. So vulnerabilities are, of course, bad. Um, enough for history there. Let's talk about uh, discovery. So this would be if you're doing a pen test and you want to try to see what vulnerabilities you can find on the network. Um, I've, I'm covering three. That didn't change. My bad. OK. So the first way is what I call the harder way, but I think it's really not that much dif more difficult than the easier way. It's just command line based. And this is when you'd run the port scanner nmap to there's kind of two ways you can do this. First, you run mmap, and you can run mmap-sv to get to the um, versions of software that's running on open ports. And you can then go to a website called exploitdb, uh, type in the version names for the software running, and just see a big list of vulnerabilities associated with the software um, organized by version name. So you can just find which one is associated with the version you're attacking, and download it and run it against the target. Um, alternatively, you could run just after doing the MMAP scan, you run something called the MMAP scripting engine, which I'll demonstrate in a bit to test it manually for individual exploits. Second way is the easier way, but this one is a lot slower and a lot louder. This is when you would run a vulnerability scanner against the target. This could be um, ones called, some common ones are Nessus and OpenVos. Uh, Nessus is proprietary. I think it's about $800 for a license, but they offer 90-day free trials. And then OpenVos is the free version, which I'm guessing is pretty much the same thing. I've never used OpenVos. But these will just scan targets really thoroughly. Um, it can, these scans take a long time, but they will tell you basically a huge list of what it's vulnerable to. Um, all, all the vulnerabilities will be ranked like high, critical, medium, lower, informational. And this is good from like a blue team perspective if you're scanning your own network because it can give you a good thorough list. But if you're on the red team side of things, you don't want to do this because it generates a ton of noise. And it's really easy to spot. Um, MMAP scans are a bit quieter, but if you do one of these scans, it will be really loud. And if you run it against an actual company that has a good security system in place, you would probably be their um, number one attacker for the hour, if not the day, just because of how much noise they make. So what I'm saying is don't do that. And the last way is the I want to do as little work as possible way, which doesn't actually work. But you open Armitage, which I'll explain what that is in a bit. Um, you choose your target, click the Hail Mary button, and then, um, well, well, nothing happens, but it could work. Um, I'll explain what those are in a second. So Armitage, um, it's our front end to Metasploit. And Metasploit and Armitage are basically these two tools that can um, they contain about 3,000 exploits or so, uh, and they can be used to run these exploits against target machines. Metasploit is command line based, so it's a bit harder to use, but Armitage is easier. It's got a GUI, and you can just click around stuff. Um, Armitage, that Hail Mary button, what it does is it loads your ex or after you choose your target, it loads every exploit it has and just throws them all at the machine and hopes to see if something will happen. Um, from what I've seen in experience, it will it won't work. If it's uh, not vulnerable, nothing will happen. If it is vulnerable, it might just cause the computer to crash, but you probably won't get a shell. So don't use the Hail Mary button. This is, I'm really bad at this, I'm sorry. OK, yeah. So a couple demos. Um, they're not live demos because live demos are bad, but So this is going to be an example of the first of the two harder methods where we're going to run MMAP against the host. And then from there, based on the services running, run the MMAP scripting engine to see what it's vulnerable against. So we're going to run MMAP against our target host, which we just, it's arbitrary. If we're in 231, this is part of the 231 lab. So we're going to see that it is open on a lot of ports. Um, the main, main one we want to focus on is this port 445. That is used by Windows to run SMB. SMB was the protocol that um, was exploited in the two, two of the three attacks mentioned earlier, with MSOA067 for Configure and Eternal Blue for um, the WannaCry attack. 
So since Wildcard was, or since Eternal Blue was about two years ago, we're going to run a query at the NVAP scripting engine to see if it's vulnerable to Eternal Blue. So this is the command we want to do, which is nmap, and then we're going to do dash p445 to just scan that one port, since that's what we want to check for. And this will save a lot of time, since now we're just scanning one port instead of 1,000. And with the nmap scripting engine, we're going to run the dash dash script flag, followed by smb vuln ms17010, which is a technical name for Eternal Blue, and then again, just the target host. And since this is against only one port, this should be pretty quick. And it's already done. And it will say that, yes, it is indeed vulnerable. So now we know it's vulnerable, we can load up Metasploit against it. Whoops. There we go. OK. So just start at Metasploit. It's terminal based, so this is really all it looks like. And let's go. And the command is off the screen. So you're going to load the exploit by typing use exploit, and then Windows, SMB, and then MS17010. And then from here, um, you can see, you can kind of see that there's actually three different exploits in Metasploit for this vulnerability. Um, basically, just load one try it, and if it doesn't work, then load another one. Um, from experience, I knew that the first two didn't really work for whatever, for whatever reason. So I'm just going to skip straight to the third, the PSXEC one. So now I have the exploit loaded. And from here, we just got to set our target host, which is just one command. We just set our host command. That's the same target that we ran the MAP scan against. So we got it loaded. And then from here, we type exploit, and it will run. And that will drop us if it works. Which it does into a interpreter shell. And then from here we type shell, and now we have an administrative shell on the box. So not too many steps to take to go from an MF scan to running Metasploit, loading the exploit, and then um, exploiting and getting a shell. So that's if you got like a real high critical vulnerability in a box. But not every vulnerability is usually that strong or that good, I guess. Um, a lot of the times, it will be maybe just like a simple information leak or an unprivileged user account or something like that. And for those, you want to use a website called ExploitDB. Um, I mentioned earlier that there are 3,000 exploits in Metasploit, but there are way more than 3,000 CVEs released every year. It's probably upwards of 10,000 or maybe even 20,000. So Metasploit, of course, doesn't have them all. Um, some of these less cool ones you have to search on exploit DB for. So to give you a demonstration of that one, it's going to be pulled up. So this is going to be, and then I'm scanning against a different target this time. Um, we're going to use the dash s v switch to scan for version numbers. Uh, this one takes a bit longer to scan. S v switch scans take like half a minute or so, so skip to there, or 15 seconds. Um, so here's what's also that scan against different host. Against this one, we see that SSH is running Open SSH version six. So we're going to try to target that one. The current version is, I think, OpenSSH version 7.7, .7, so it's definitely out of date, and there's probably some good vulnerabilities for that one. So we're going to head over to ExploitDB, which I have pulled up. Did I just skip to the? Oh, my bad. So exploitdb is what you're going to get. Um, from here, you type into the search bar just the name of your um, service that you're trying to exploit. And it will return a big list of basically every important open SSH vulnerability. Um, I think there are about 50 or so on this page, but it's cut off. But right at the top, there's these three that are vulnerable to open SSH between versions 2.3 and 7.7. .7. And this the third one includes proof of concept code, so we're going to Check that one out. And basically what this vulnerability is is that um, when you try to authenticate against an SSH server, 
it will, and you don't authenticate, type the wrong username or password in, it should just say invalid username or password and you don't know necessarily if the user you tried is on the box or not. But if you, I think, look at the exact byte stream that it returns, you can see that if there is a user, it will return one thing, and if there's not, it will turn a slightly different thing. And using this exploit, you can kind of take advantage of that and see what remote users are on a box. So it's not the most useful, but it's better than nothing. And this is useful if you have like maybe a list of potential users and you want to see which ones are in a box. And then once you determine which, once you determine which ones are, you can go on to more um, important, th more cool things like password cracking to try to get into the box or something like that. So download the exploit, which did off, did off screen. And to run it, um, this is the command, which it, it's a Python script, so I'm with Python. And if you run it with no args, it'll tell you what the args are. In this case, it requires two, which are the IP address of the target and then the username that you're going to enumerate. So we're going to just run the scan, and we're going to see if Alice is on this remote box. And this takes about 10 seconds or so. And that one did not work. So we're going to try again with Bob. And I'll just skip ahead. Bob didn't work either. So we're going to try last time with Sid. And Sid, OK. Sid was valid. So that one worked. So now from here, you know, we don't have a shell, but we have progress. We have successfully exploited something. May not be the most interesting thing, but most exploits aren't just free shells. And then from here, we can actually maybe social engineer Sid or um, start password cracking. Or maybe we already have his password and we just um, move from there. So that's exploit DB. Um, oh, I have one more demo. Um, let's get a pull up. OK, so last demo is going to be trying the Hail Mary button. Um, should add that I'm doing this in Kali Linux, which is just Linux with like 400 or so, I think way more than that actually, just hacker tools installed. So this came with Nmap, um, all the Nmap scripting engine stuff, Metasploit and Armitage on it. So I'm going to open up Armitage. Um, this one takes a while to open. Uh, once we get this here, I'm going to go to Hosts in the top bar and just add our, the first host we did, the Windows host that we got Eternal Blue on. So we know it's vulnerable. And then from here, we're going to go to Attacks, and then click Hail Mary. And it will give us this warning message saying, this is a bad idea, don't do it. You'll get caught, and you won't get a shell. But we're going to ignore that and try it anyway. And then when you do this, it will just run every exploit and metasploit against it, which takes about half a minute or so. And once this is done, nothing happens. So yeah, just kind of, I've never seen this work, but not no, but just don't do it. It doesn't work. This is my takeaway from that. So that's all I have for red team stuff. Um, for the blue team side of things, talk about mitigation, um, kind of vulnerability management. Um, the ideal idea in my head would be to just uninstall Windows and replace everything with Linux because Microsoft sucks. And then run apt update or apt dist upgrade or whatever your update everything command is for Linux as a cron job to run like every week at 3 a.m. or so. And you should never have to worry about vulnerabilities on your system. But this doesn't happen. Um, the world runs on Windows, a bunch of don't like to admit it. And yeah, it's just not that simple. So it's a bit more complicated than that. And so some steps you can take to secure your network. One would be to just regularly run vulnerability scanners like um, Nessus or OpenVos against your network to see what vulnerabilities are on your network. You might figure out that some remote server you thought had Windows Update going, but it was in fact turned off, and that's why there's just 100 high exploits against it. Um, the nice things about it are that it does rank the vulnerabilities so you can prioritize them. Some of them will go beyond just giving it a high, medium, low. It will actually give it a numeric score, so you can um, prioritize that this one, this vulnerability has a score of 6, and this vulnerability has a score of 20,000. Got to patch that one first. Um, so I want to run those regularly and look at the results. Another thing you can do is use a package manager for Windows. 
kind of like how on Linux you can just run update and it'll update all the software on your computer. Windows has these two. I don't know how they work, but they exist. Um, I know Chocolaty is one. So these would be useful if you want to just update everything like Java, your browsers, Flash, all at once, which is cumbersome on Windows. So um, it's a lot easier if you have a package manager going. Um, if you don't want a package manager, you can use just use an antivirus that will scan for out-of-date software. Um, the free version of Avast does this, and I believe Kaspersky does as well. Um, I ran Avast for like five years, even though it is uh, pretty um, big and it slows down your computer a lot. The main reason I kept it was just because of the software updater feature it has, where it will scan for things like, in this example, 7-zip, Adobe stuff, Java, Firefox, your browsers, and it will just update them for you in the background, which is really nice and a lot easier than just trying to figure out how to update Java and Flash for the 5 billionth time and learn that 3 billion devices run Java again. So now you can use those as well, because it's not just about vulnerabilities that exist on servers, it's about client stuff as well. Um, I also want to make sure that you uninstall and disable any unused software. Um, the kind of the popular version of this is don't have any ports open that don't matter. Don't have any services listing that don't matter. If you don't need them, turn them off. But this can apply to um, really client side stuff as well. If you're not using Java, don't use it. I don't install it. Java is pretty insecure. Um, Another thing you want to do is you want to watch for major CVEs that get released because although it is great that if um, you're patching every week you have all the updates installed automatically, if some critical zero day gets dropped or there's a patch released for it, you want to have that patch immediately. So say you have a patch management, pa a vulnerability management system that involves running system updates every Sunday at 3 a.m. So that's great. But say come Wednesday, there is um, an alert from P about PHP that says that there's six um, remote code execution vulnerabilities that were just patched. You don't want to wait until Sunday to get that patch. You want to patch that immediately, because once the patch comes out, um, attackers are, are going to immediately start reverse engineering the code to try to figure out how the vulnerability worked. And then from there, start writing exploits for it. And they can get them done, if they're quick enough, the day of. I don't think of seen any major instances where that happened, but it could be done. So you want to, if a major CV ever gets dropped, you want to make sure you patch the day of, um, which isn't an issue. It shouldn't be an issue, just updating PHP on a web server. If it has to restart, being down for two seconds shouldn't be a big, big deal. Um, you also want to make sure you track end of life software. For example, if you're running like Ubuntu, um, let's say 11.10, and it's 2019, that's been unsupported for plenty of years, so you're not getting the security patches that people aren't running like Ubuntu 18.4 would be getting. So if you're on an out-of-date server, you want to try to migrate off of it to a more recent version. Um, um, I guess a more reasonable example would be like Windows XP. Still a lot of Windows XP out there, um, which is insecure, because I think that reached end of life a few years ago, so it doesn't get the security updates. Um, another popular one right now is Flash. Um, Flash is going to be discontinued, I think, next year. And they announced they're discontinuing it like three years ago or so, but there's still a ton of Flash servers out there. And if, say, you're running a Flash server, then you want to try to migrate off of that because if it's 2021 and you're still running it and more Flash vulnerabilities get uh, discovered, they're not going to get patched. So. You don't want to just keep those vulnerabilities hanging around. You want to try to maybe rewrite your application in something other than Flash so that you don't have to worry about it anymore. Uh, I think that's all I have. Are there any questions? Oh. All right, thanks, everyone. Yes? Uh, what's a good way to practice this stuff legally? Um, Exploitation-wise? Yeah. Um, Metasploitable is a website that has a bunch of vulnerable VMs that you can test against. And I think Vulnhub as well is probably a good one for that. And hack the box. And yeah. So lots of options. Yeah. All right. So with that, we're getting to our beginner's night on how to be a blue teamer by Logan Rollery. So if you're interested in doing the upcoming CDC, I recommend sticking around for this to learn what steps you should be doing to secure your boxes.